We're four friends with hot takes on food media. And we're here to review and recap all kinds of food shows in bite-sized seasons. Plus, virtual potlucks, cooking adventures, and food memes. Welcome to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. Hi, I'm Amanda. Hey, it's Justine. And it's me, Meg. Welcome to Pod Appetit Gourmet Takes. This season, we are covering the Netflix original series, The Chef Show, Season 1, Volume 1. In The Chef Show, writer, director, and food enthusiast John Favreau and Chef Roy Choi explore food in and out of the kitchen with accomplished chefs and celebrity friends. But before we get into the chef show today, let's find out what we've been cooking, eating, and getting up to in the kitchen. Justine, how about you? What have you been up to? Well, our listeners, if they follow our Instagram, already know what I made. I made some decadent s'mores brownies. (laughs) I wanted to have fun. (laughs) They look delicious. Thank you. You know, they aren't even fully gluten-free. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> but I was making them for my friends. You know what? I've got so many, like, food restrictions right now that I'm, like, so bored with what I'm eating and cooking for myself that I, like, texted my friend Dan. I said, what do you want? <laughs> and he's just like, uh, brownies? And I'm like, okay. I'll make him s'mores brownies because I just wanted to like, you know, just really make something completely just fun. Yeah. So they've got a graham cracker um, crust at the bottom that you bake off first and then brownie in the middle. There's only chocolate chips in the brownies. And then on top, I use dandies, which are vegan uh, marshmallows. And then you just layer those on top, stick that in for a broil with a little bit more of that graham cracker on the top with a little more of a chocolate chips on the top. You know, it's a classic graham cracker, chocolate, marshmallow, graham cracker, (laughs) sandwich of yum. (laughs) I saw Margaret on Instagram was asking if you snuck in some black beans to make it healthy. Nope. (laughs) Nope. Just decadence. Melted chocolate, white cane sugar. These are not. <laughs> the, I think the point was like, I'm not eating these, so I'm making them there not go. healthy. <laughs> Classic flavor combos. I love s'mores. Everything about them. There used to be these yeah. commercial s'mores candy bars. You would find them with the Snickers or the Twix or whatever. Ooh. I loved them so much, and then they stopped making them. I wish they would bring oh them back, gosh. though. Petition to bring back the s'mores bars. That sounds amazing. What kind of malo texture was the inside? It was closer to nougat than like a really squishy marshmallow, you know, but it was still marshmallowy. And if I remember correctly, mm. the gram was like these sort of tiny balls, kind of like little gram pellets. It was interesting Ooh, wow. texture. It's really good. Listeners, if you know at all what I'm talking about, let me know. <laughs> yeah. I, this is just Sounds great. making me want graham crackers. and like. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got a whole other box of graham crackers, which I might make something else today for my friend Dan. I'm just going <laughs> to keep doing that. I'd be like, all right, what's something with sugar and sweet? I, I just enjoy baking as a hobby. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm doing. So, yeah. What about you, Amanda? What have you been up to? Um, I haven't done a lot of, like, cooking or anything. We've just been doing a lot of, like, frozen meals and stuff. I've been eating a lot of cereal, trying to save up to buy a new car. Cereal and milk is pretty cheap. But last weekend, we had our belated Christmas celebration uh, with my mom's family. (laughs) And my nephews gave me a Harry Potter baking cookbook. Oh, fun. So it's, yeah, it's all, I mean, you can make like the Harry Potter, like birthday cake, of course. When I flipped through it briefly, it also looked like there were some fun things like um, Dobby cupcakes and stuff like that. So I'm looking forward to exploring that and maybe making some fun things for my nephews. Some pumpkin pasties. Do you believe pumpkin pasties are in there? I'm going to have to look, <laughs> take a closer look and like send you guys some of the pictures because it's just like a lot of it's really cute and whimsical and, you know, reminds me a little of like Kim Joy baking of like, it's about mm-hmm. being like cute and fun and mm-hmm. 
So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And then we combined Christmas dinner and Chinese New Year and Valentine's Day all in one feast at my mom's. Oh, my gosh. So there was, like, Christmas ham, and then we also had Chinese food, and then my mom threw in pad thai just because some of us like pad thai. And, like, it was a... Oh, my gosh. And there was a a charcuterie board with some delicious things. Charcuterie board. Yeah. (laughs) Which now my sisters always go, here, Amanda, would you like some of the charcuterie board as soon as (laughs) I get there? And I'm just like... like, and yes, I would. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> pot appetite influence meg when you said um pumpkin pasties it reminded me of what's that episode when we were just... our pasties versus pasties discussion <laughs> yes <laughs> it immediately popped in my head i was like pumpkin pasties i'll make some i'll, I'll make some pumpkin pasties and then i'll also make some pumpkin pasties oh. how does that sound <laughs> <laughs> not those pics are not to be shared on instagram <laughs> all right we get us some followers <laughs> we're almost to 1000 <laughs> i think that would have to be only fans right um anyway so <laughs> only flans <laughs> what about you meg what have you been up to i freestyled a quasi sort of korean dish there's this Korean dish called, excuse my pronunciation, I don't know how to pronounce Korean, but there's a Korean dish called chokboki, which is a rice cake based dish with like gochujang. And in that dish, the rice cakes are these cylindrical, almost pasta tube looking rice cakes. So I didn't have those type of rice cakes. I have a different kind called chokguk, which are flat kind of ovular rice cakes. They actually used them in our second episode we're talking about today. They Mm. put them in the seaweed soup. So I had those rice cakes. You hydrate them overnight. And I cooked them up with soy sauce, chili oil, sesame oil, gochujang. And then I added some bok choy at the end just to get it a little bit wilted. Oh, and a little bit of cornstarch, too, to thicken up the whole thing. And then I plated it with scallions and with some sesame seeds on top. And it was really, really good. I just love rice cakes. I love mochi. I love stuff made with rice flour because it gets this really nice, chewy, kind of gummy texture. Mm -hmm. And I just love that texture of rice cakes. This was really, really good. Well, on the menu for today, we have two episodes. Episode five, Robert Rodriguez and First Friday and episode six, David Chang. So starting off with episode five, um, Roy and John make pizza and chat creativity with Robert Rodriguez. Then John goes to work in the local truck and explores L.A.'s food truck history. So one of the things with this one, I know who Robert Rodriguez was, but I don't feel like if, if you didn't know who Robert Rodriguez was, they did not say who he was until like 15 minutes into this episode. I do think it would be worthwhile to give a short bio. Also, I thought it was funny because when they did sort of have his name at the bottom of the screen and that little Chiron that says like what he might be known for, mm-hmm. it said Alita Battle Angel. And I'm like, really? That's what we're going to go to for Robert Rodriguez, not like Machete or, or anything else. <laughs> I mean, I, I did really like Alita. Well, that's what they were promoting that day. They <laughs> definitely were promoting it. It was very topical at the time. And I did actually really quite enjoy that movie. But I don't think that's going to make the top of his IMDb list necessarily. No. And especially like they talk about his whole like creative process and filming process of El Mariachi. Mm -hmm. But, like, that is never listed as his credits on those little, like (laughs) like you said, like, yeah, he's done so many other things. I would think, especially, like, if you're watching with the family on, like, Netflix, Spy Kids is going to be, like, the first thing people know him from. (laughs) Yeah, so he's a director and filmmaker. He directed all the things we already mentioned. He also directed Sin City, From Dusk Till Dawn and a few episodes of The Book of Boba Fett and The Mandalorian. So that must be the John Favreau connection working its way again. Mm. Mm -hmm. They also mentioned the book he wrote, Rebel Without a Crew, which many uh, film students have for required reading. Mm. 
Have you read that one, Justine? I have not, but I do believe it is in this apartment somewhere, (laughs) so I could read it. (laughs) This episode felt a lot to me like the Avengers Atlanta episode. It's a lot more about shooting the shit about filmmaking than it is about food. It is a bit about food, but I kept a close eye on Roy, and I don't really know Roy Choi's personality, but... He didn't seem to say much about the food or get too visibly excited about it, which just made me wonder, like, is this food, like, just okay for someone who's a home cook or is it actually good, you know? So I feel like this is one of the episodes where it was more about the chit-chat than about actually exploring food. It felt like the thing he got most excited for was the chocolate. Hmm. He did. Well, I actually like the format. I actually like the format for this episode a lot because... I think it found like this interesting niche of being an interview with like food as a vehicle. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be like, I like this episode the most because of that. And you'd be like, well, they just talked about filmmaking. Yeah, they talked about film editing, Justine. Justine. (laughs) Let's be real here. (laughs) But still, I like the format of the episode because it was sort of uh, Robert Rodriguez centered instead of like John and and Roy centered, which I, I less like because they tend to like, talk amongst themselves a lot more Mm -hmm. i don't know there's a there's a thing with this show where i know and they have discussed that they in this first season they didn't really know what the show was and they didn't have like a format yet and they were trying a bunch of different things but i liked this particular format where it's sort of them interviewing this guy while he makes food i do think that is better format wise than avengers atlanta where they all just sat around a table at a restaurant and talked And in this case, like you said, they do have the food also to talk about, kind of like the Bill Burr episode, I suppose. Mm. It did have that very, I don't want to say like Hollywood elite, but when they start saying, oh, Jim, when they're referencing James Cameron, you know, (laughs) it's things like that where I'm like, please, (laughs) like, you guys are so unrelatable. (laughs) Well, I mean, the man also has a pizza oven in his home kitchen, like... (laughs) It's not super relatable on many levels. It's also <laughs> casually talking about how, you know, Oscar winner Benicio Del Toro is just stopping by for five pizzas. Yeah, I guess I just don't like the name dropping. I hate name dropping in any situation. So I'm just kind of like, I don't care who you're friends with. Like, yeah. I just really don't. This is, it's so very LA. It's, it's very <laughs> so. But I mean, like, also sort of, the Robert Rodriguez vibe and how they talk about everything about how he's able to just pick up everything and do it just based off a of study and working hard how he picked up filmmaking and just did it himself how he's picking up cooking and doing it himself I'm like well I mean that's great for men <laughs> <laughs> I did like some of the things they said about creativity and being a creative person and having a creative outlook and Robert Rodriguez was saying you know he makes his actors paint or draw and he says you learn more about your primary job if you do other creative endeavors and I feel like that's really true I think that that's a true and helpful statement I was just thinking back to I studied English for my degree and part of the requirements for English was to study another language a foreign language and at first I was like why do I have to do this but then it became very obvious very quickly that you learn more about your own language when comparing it to other languages. And I feel like that can definitely also be said for creative endeavors. And he also said, you learn how to, how to learn, which I mm-hmm. think is also an interesting idea. Like you won't necessarily even know how to pursue or why you should pursue different creative endeavors unless you try it. And through trying, you learn what actually will help you then gain additional skills. Yeah, I I mm-hmm. did like the parallels he drew between the ideas of like or the the arts of cooking and filmmaking and the whole idea of like, you know, you have to set up your ingredients and your mise en place and that's like making sure you have your shot list for the day and the prep work and you know and then so I, I liked those parallels that he and John as well were were exploring and making in this episode, you know, minus all the name dropping. I thought that was interesting. And I agree. Like, for me, you know, I, I also have an English 
degree, but I also have a minor in music. Having that background in music helps me in other artistic endeavors, whether I'm doing stuff with live theater or I'm doing stuff with podcasting and it just various things like that. You can kind of use different art forms and bring it in to something else that you're doing. So all of that was very yeah. interesting. So yeah, I agree. Pre watching this episode a couple of weeks ago, I was talking um, to one of my assistant editors and we do talk about cooking a lot as well. And we were, we were talking about learning how to edit and learning how to trust your instincts. And I did relate it to cooking. I said, you know how when you start cooking, you read a recipe, but then you start to learn how things taste and you just learn when things are ready to, to go and ready to stop being cooking. I was like, it's, kind of, it's like that with editing too, where you, you start by doing things by the book and you follow the rules, but then you break the rules and that's how you learned your instincts. And then I watched this and I was just like, I said that too. <laughs> John was really into that dragon doodle. I thought he was going to spend the whole episode drawing what that thing. What was <laughs> that about? What was happening there? <laughs> well, Robert Rodriguez said whenever he has somebody creative come to his house, whether it's like a filmmaker or an actor or whatnot, he has them draw something in that book, which really made me oh want to see what the earlier pages were. <laughs> Benicio del Toro drawing some pizzas or something. Yeah. <laughs> Flying pizzas. You can't just go to somebody's house to chill. They're like, create art for me right now. <laughs> Do some work before you enjoy my food. <laughs> Speaking of making food for other people, like you were talking about, Justine, Robert Rodriguez here makes a quote unquote regular pizza dough for his guests, John and Roy, but then he makes a <laughs> cauliflower rice dough slash crust for himself and they cook it up and I just like oven. that attitude <laughs> well John was like do you have real dough <laughs> I'm like what the ugh, ugh, you know I hate grinds my years <laughs> people say like real and I'm like what's not real about what gluten-free food or vegan food or like it is still food it is still ingredients real dough i was like oh my gosh yeah but you can't have the fun of tossing a cauliflower crust it's just not gonna work no you can't it's true <laughs> you'd be very gentle with that crust. When, when robert rodriguez was teaching john favreau how to toss a pizza dough with that towel i really wondered how much roy Choi was like just like standing back and thinking um, sir, I'm an actual chef <laughs> and I would like to teach you some actual things, but just like held it in. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered that too. Yeah, they did make interesting pizza. They had surprising toppings. Kimchi. They were just like, let's throw every leftover on pizza. And so I was like, yes. Yeah. And they had some barbecue from Franklin's Barbecue. They filmed this episode mm -hmm. in Austin. And I know that Franklin's Barbecue is one of the guests in one of the later episodes in this volume. Oh. So it was kind of a little sneak peek. It was nice to see them get out of L.A. for part of this episode. But then act totally L.A. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can take the, the filmmakers out of L.A., but you can't take the L.A. out of the filmmakers. <laughs> <laughs> and they made the dessert pizza, which was kind of like a sopapilla. It was basically just dough with honey. Mm. I laughed mm -hmm. at the story about the beekeeper keeping queen bees in his pockets and John didn't believe it. He's like, he's lying. Bees in your pockets. But it's true. It's true. And if you want it's true. a cool Instagram to follow, there's this lady who has an Instagram called Texas Bee Works, I believe. And she films all of her beehive removal work that she does. And she's got tons of queen bees in her pocket in little cages. <laughs> Have you ever put a bee in your pocket, Meg? Or do you have bees in your pocket right now? <laughs> Fair question. No, not at this moment. <laughs> it was like one time my husband opened the refrigerator and he's like, what's this in the brown bag? And I was like, oh, bees. <laughs> Did he look in it and say... <laughs> Dead bees do not eat. <laughs> Well, I don't know what I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> Next part of the episode. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, after that, they go back to LA and go to the first Friday 
food truck area in it was Venice, right? Yep. They called it a street food festival. If I understood correctly, it sounded like it used to be a place where there were just always food trucks all the time. And that's where Kogi would go often in its early days. But then Roy was saying they kind of had to clear out and now they're only there some of the time. And I believe First Friday is like an event. It's not always there all the time. I don't Yeah, it seemed like they all go in that particular parking lot for the first Friday each month. Of the month, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a abbotkinneyboulevard.com slash First Fridays is the website. Due to COVID pandemic, First Friday is canceled until further notice. Womp womp. Womp womp. I will say watching the whole gathering of the food truck and festival and everybody just mingling around and eating food and going from truck to truck, it did really make me miss doing things like that pre-pandemic. Definitely. (laughs) We used to often go get food trucks at work while we'd choose like hey do you want to go grab something from this restaurant or you just go check out whatever food trucks are there because yeah as they've alluded to many times LA's big food truck culture and they will set up uh so where I used to work was right across from I want to say blizzard but like anywhere where there's like a big like corporate office there's generally like food trucks nearby at Mm -hmm. lunchtime Mm -hmm. (laughs) definitely Yeah, it looked like a really fun scene. Made me wish I could go to something like that again Mm -hmm. (laughs) someday. Yeah, I was like, oh, summer, oh, COVID, right, right. (laughs) And John helped out on the line at a food truck called Local that had burgers and foldies, which I hadn't heard of before. I guess they're kind of like a hybrid between tacos and quesadillas. So they're these grilled, cheesy taco quesadilla things. I Mm -hmm. enjoyed watching Roy be like, "Uh, no, John, these are not good. You are not giving these to people. (laughs) Telling him to go back and try again. Yeah, it was fun watching this episode in contrast with the next episode where he does seem very honestly impressed with John's work and skills in the next episode. Whereas in this one, he's really like giving him a brow beating, you know, like, this isn't good enough. I would never serve this. But he just wanted to look cool in front of all the people. I think so. I think so. That was his yeah. stomping ground. He had to be, you know, the big fish. Which does make you wonder, did some of those people know John Favreau was making them food, or did they not realize that until this episode aired? <laughs> At least John asked this time whether he would be in the way or not. And they kindly said, no, he wouldn't, even though that probably was a lie. (laughs) Well, they get to be on camera, too, so. (laughs) True. Good advertisement for their trucks. Yeah, and they hit up, like, all the trucks. And, I mean, that's the only one that they went on and actually, you know, made food with them. But they went on to a lot of the other trucks just to kind of look at them. Like, that, the one that had the pizza oven on it that was, like, a Mm -hmm. shipping container. Yeah, they said they had to have the whole truck custom built in order to accommodate the, I believe they said 6,000 pound pizza oven. Uh Mm. Yeah, it was interesting to see, you know, the different food truck styles, not just of the food, but the trucks themselves. Like they were saying, this is a fun thing about going to a food truck festival is that you can get all sorts of different cuisines in one place. You can get every single part of the meal. You can get a side, you can get a main course, you can get a dessert, you can get a drink. It's really fun where it's just this one-stop shop with all these different foods to easily experience. Yes. My favorite LA food truck is the Sushi Burritos. (laughs) Sushi (laughs) Rito. So if you had gone to this food truck festival, what food truck would you have gone to? Out of the ones they showed? Yes. Cool house. Yeah, I was going to say ice cream sandwich. (laughs) Yeah, I I also. (laughs) (laughs) That funfetti sugar cookie they were describing sounded very good to me. I loved the idea that you got to choose both the cookie and the ice cream. So you could get so many different kinds of combinations. And if you want food truck food at home, I have a small plug which is Food Ooh. Truck Road Trip, a cookbook by Kim Pham and Philip Shen. This is a husband and wife team. They have the website behindthefoodcarts.com, which was named the best culinary travel blog by Severe Magazine. 
And this cookbook has recipes collected from street food vendors and food trucks coast to coast in the U.S. And yeah, so you can check out the recipes and make them at home. Do you have to both be working simultaneously in the kitchen to fully enjoy the cooking? (laughs) Maybe if you want to recreate the food truck experience. There you go. I don't know. Sometimes my kitchen feels like a food truck is so tiny. (laughs) That sounds like mine, as you saw, that I have no counter space. I work on the stove. Oh my god. You don't have no counter space. You got no counters. You gotta have counters for <laughs> counter space. We do have a stove and a fridge. Yay! You're halfway there. Buy you a, a card table or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but where would it go? Anyway, we are going to take a quick break and then we will be back with the next episode. And we're back. Now we are looking at episode six, David Chang. John and Roy head into the kitchen to make dueling fried rice recipes before welcoming in David Chang to cook and discuss some classic Korean dishes. I feel like this is maybe the most contained episode so far because they were not in like that big open kitchen that they've been in before where they filmed with Babish or Bill Burr um, or the Remembering Jonathan Gold episode where it seemed like there was more space. This seemed to be like in an actual working restaurant kitchen. Isn't that Roy's kitchen? Like one of his uh, restaurant kitchens? That's what I was assuming, but I don't think it said specifically where they were, did it? Other than L.A.? Because I think the other one you're talking about, the other space we've seen, that's that's a, clearly a set, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you're right. This is more, this is an actual working space. Yeah, there's just one location. It seemed like it was all filmed on the same day. David Chang comes to them. So yeah, it was a very self-contained episode. It's a bottle episode. Bottle episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, we're such nerds. <laughs> Well, and this, you know, brings in things from from the previous episode where you have John exploring more with the cauliflower rice. Like you said, Meg, this is where you see Roy appreciating John's work more than he did on the food truck in the previous episode. I'm also entertained by this pattern emerging where John makes a recipe that Roy gave him himself in the past and then he utterly denies it he's like i don't remember giving you that salsa verde recipe (laughs) i don't remember telling you to make caramel with half sugar and half water (laughs) but to me with this one though it felt like roy was like a bit off his game though i don't know if he seemed like distracted or something maybe it's because he was on his turf and he was like working or doing something else but like even especially with like John being like, I've got whole garlic and chopped garlic. He's like, am I meant to have both? And Roy's just like, ah. <laughs> yeah, he just had the mise en place out and he said, just put it all in. It's already measured. And yeah, why would you have whole garlic cloves and chopped garlic? It did seem like a little oopsie, maybe. But it, it did seem like he, I very genuine, his reactions to like the salsa verde when he was like, oh, this is better than mine. And John's like, no, but it is yours. <laughs> it is yours. <laughs> He says you're battling with your past self. Yes. (laughs) This is the problem that's not actually a problem with chefs is that, like we've been talking about, you so often don't need a recipe if you're an expert. You just kind of go by instinct. But then I guess when you do that, if you don't have a recipe, then how are you supposed to recreate it? Like, if not for the fact that he had texted the salsa verde recipe to John at some point, he probably never would have made it that same way ever again. Well, and that John's like, I'll find it and I will email it to you. <laughs> <laughs> this made me really want some fried rice. Both of their oh, fried God. rices looked so good. Yes. Watching both of them make the fried rice, I'm seriously considering seeing if I can order in some Chinese food. Because they, I think the only Asian we have around here is Chinese food where I live currently. And oh, I just I just want really good fried rice. And especially the way like they, they put the egg in on both mm-hmm. of them. I love a fried rice that has like a little bit of a, a scrambled egg within it. It just, and you get that little like crispy. It's it, like they were saying, it's all about the textures, I think, with fried rice. If mm-hmm. I get a fried rice that doesn't have egg in it, I'm not going to be happy. <laughs> That's not fried rice. <laughs> you know how people are like, oh, you're vegan. So like, do you miss cheese? Do you miss meat? I'm like, nah, but egg though. I could eat some egg. <laughs> Eggs are good. 
I mean, both of these episodes talk about the magic of eggs, whether it's with the cauliflower pizza or here in the fried rice. They're good for flavor. They're good for texture, consistency, binding. The incredible edible egg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, advertising <laughs> doing its job. Oh, damn it. Big egg propaganda. <laughs> Can you sing the jingle? <laughs> Yeah, and then David Chang swoops in and tries the fried rice. So should we give the bio for David Chang? Sure, go for it. He's a Korean-American chef. He also wears a lot of different hats. He's a restaurateur. He runs the Momofuku restaurant group. And the Momofuku Co. restaurant is Michelin starred. I believe it has two Michelin stars. He's also an author. He started the Lucky Peach magazine, which had such contributors as Anthony Bourdain and many other famous chefs and food personalities. He also wrote Eat a Peach, which is a memoir that came out relatively recently and caused a bit of a fuss because a lot of people spoke out about their past working relationships and other relationships with David Chang and how he has anger issues, which he talked about pretty candidly in his memoir. And he also talks about how he was recently diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So you might have heard of him for those reasons in the news recently. Another thing he wrote, which we've talked about, is a cookbook he wrote along with Priya Krishna, who we love. So that Mm -hmm. was Cooking at Home or How I Learned to Stop Worrying About Recipes and Love My Microwave, the longest title ever (laughs) with uh, maybe unnecessary Dr. Strangelove reference. And he Mm -hmm. also has TV shows. He has Ugly Delicious on Netflix. And he's moving into our territory, of course. He also has two podcasts, The David (gasps) Chang Show and The Recipe Club. So can I share where I first discovered David Chang? Yeah. It was during the Pyeongchang uh, Winter Olympics because he was a special correspondent for uh, NBC where he would go and like visit places in Korea and have Korean food and talk about it. Oh, really? I didn't know he did that. Yeah. I, that's how I was first introduced to him. Though, now that I know he's involved with Momofuku, I believe I had a Milk Bar cookbook at that point. Yes. I also first heard about him through Milk Bar, which is part of the Momofuku restaurant group. And they have an amazing, super bougie, gourmet funfetti cake. It's like the most amazing funfetti cake you've ever seen. (laughs) (laughs) They also have really good cookies and pies. They have a milk bar in Las Vegas and also a Momofuku restaurant in Las Vegas. And I had a friend slash coworker who went to Vegas and brought back a whole bunch of food and it was amazing. So that's when I first tried Momofuku slash milk bar stuff. But this same friend went to the actual Momofuku restaurant and had fried chicken with caviar, which is a thing you can get apparently. (laughs) Oh my God. I enjoyed him in this episode and particularly his discussions about Korean food with Roy and how they were talking about Not all Korean food is the same because there's regional stuff both within Korea and then also where you grew up in the U.S. if you're a Korean American. Yeah, it's something that Americans, it seems, need to be reminded of over and over that a culture does not equal a monolith. So just because they have a similar Korean American background, it's still quite different. And it was also interesting that John had met David before and his sort of reminiscence of like being, it seemed like he was very intimidated by <laughs> David and was kind of worried about him like tasting the stuff that he had he had cooked. Yeah, he said it's like a scene in a movie where you meet the good guy, but you don't know that he's the good guy at first and you think he might be the villain. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that Roy was like sticking up for John and where he, you know, he presented the cauliflower rice dish and was like, The Padawan has become a Jedi. (laughs) (laughs) Gotta speak John Favreau's language. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Roy also made, you know, uh, Hobbit references later. I I like when Roy shows he's also a giant nerd. It's pretty good. (laughs) The first dish that they make is a seaweed soup, and they called it a birthday soup. They said that it's traditional to eat said soup on your birthday, and both David and 
Roy reminisced about how they kind of hated it because it was this <laughs> weird phlegm-like seaweed soup and they were just like, no, this is embarrassing. I want a hot dog and birthday cake. It was fun to see David like claim the dish, that like reclaim it and make it his own. Yeah, he said that he wanted to make the dish that he would have liked as a 10 year old. Mm -hmm. He also says he wants to tweak it or zhuzh it up without quote, ripping its guts out. So basically he says Mm. he wants it to be fundamentally the same recipe, but yet different enough that like you said, it's something he would have enjoyed as a kid or that anyone would enjoy, but it's still recognizable what its inspiration was. There's a lot of uh, ox that was involved like the the broth that he used was based on oxtail and then they chopped or not chopped they more like crumpled not crumpled crumbled shredded (laughs) crumbled is the word i would word i was looking for yeah crumbled or shredded up like they pulled apart bits of oxtail to put in there so it wasn't just the seaweed it also had some other things going on yeah, if you look at the the breakout of the dish, I think that's where it gets its fatty element from. Yeah, I'll sure we'll, we'll talk more about this in our digest episode, but I do like the animations that they're doing where it breaks down all the ingredients and then comes back together in the dish. I do like that element too. I think the animation style is cute. Yeah, I don't have much to say about this episode. Like I said, it's it's this kind of format when it's mostly like John and Roy, it's they are buds hanging out together and they don't engage with the audience as much and it kind of loses me. I mean, I don't know. I think I still enjoy it, but not... I I do agree that I think it's more fun when they are interacting with more people. And it did feel like even though this was the David Chang episode, he disappears for big parts of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he enters the episode kind of late. He sort of takes a backseat role for the rest of the episode. I do think that I have less to say as well, Justine. (laughs) I was looking at my notes and in comparison, I'm like, yeah, I've got very few notes on this one compared to some other episodes. And I guess I'll have to think about that. I'm not sure why exactly, but maybe we'll circle back to that also in the digest. It's it's about Mm -hmm. the food, but it's not instructive enough about the food that it would be like, oh, I'm learning how to make this recipe. Yes, I think that is a big part of this one. Because at least even in the first Friday, like food truck festival, you were getting more instruction, even in the, you know, not just in the local food truck, but even like when they went and they were looking at the pizza oven, like there was instruction on like how they put together this food truck. Whereas there were some parts in this episode at one point, I think it was when Roy was making one of the marinades. And he was listing all of the ingredients as he put it in. And then he put in like one or two ingredients and didn't say what they even were. I think they made like four things in this episode, but I couldn't tell you like what was in them. (laughs) Yeah, you really would have to pause that exploded view in the animation section to really Mm -hmm. know every ingredient that goes into it. And yeah, not terribly easy to recreate. But then again, he does also have very fancy restaurants, so maybe it's not that recreatable anyway at home. (laughs) And you don't get like the how and the why for each ingredient either. Yes. It it kind of seemed like this was more of David Chang and Roy Choi both making their takes on traditional Korean dishes and kind of introducing the other one to it. I did like when they talked about beef specifically. So that's they true. made a couple recipes. They made what they called Roy's Colby and also Bray's Colby stew, both of which have marinated beef. And they were saying that they thought it was kind of funny that barbecue beef is often considered like the quintessential Korean food, whereas they were saying in actuality, in day-to-day life, beef doesn't play a big role in the diet because it's expensive. It's something that you would get for special occasions. I found that quite interesting. I guess it's any time where I learn something, it's therefore obviously more interesting to me. Some was like, I didn't know that at all. I also associated beef with Korean food. So it was cool to learn this information. And Roy also uses orange juice in his marinade, which David was saying is kind of like, oh, that's like the unsecreted ingredient. 
apparently they do use fruit juices in the marinade, but it's usually a pear juice or an apple juice. So it's little details like that where I'm like, I didn't know any of that. So therefore it's pretty interesting to me. And even when they were talking about the cut of beef, it's a short rib. And they said that that particular cut across the ribs where you can see the rib in the cross section, that even is not really how they have it in Korea, but it's very common in, in Korean American recipes because that cut of meat was just more readily available in America and it was harder to find short ribs cut any other way. And then John says, oh yeah, this is a very common way to have short ribs in Jewish communities and Jewish cuisine. So all this information, I was like, oh, that's cool. I never would have known any of that otherwise. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I think with this episode, it was all of the the more of the cultural discussions and links that they were making that I found more interesting than the actual making of the food. It did all look very tasty. <laughs> and Roy ends the episode with a little happy dance. That little happy food <laughs> dance we all do when we're eating something delicious. <laughs> Well, this has been a very stirring conversation, but now we are going to see what we have on today's back burner. Uh, so first up, Claire Saffitz put out a video with Netflix where she is making the store-bought apple pie inspired by Don't Look Up. It's more like Netflix paid Claire Saffis a lot of money (laughs) to come and film this episode, which I'm like, girl, get your paycheck, yes. I guess they decided to tap her to promote this movie, obviously. And I have to say, I know that Don't Look Up is kind of reviled, but I enjoyed it. I don't know. (laughs) I think it got a bad rap. (laughs) I'm only 30 minutes in. I had to, like, I literally started watching it Friday and I had to take a break because the editor that Adam McKay uses, uh, he's done both this and Vice, just the editing style really drives me nuts. Unless I'm like trapped in the movie theater watching it, I have to take breaks. So I have not seen the apple pie scene yet in the movie. I watched part of Claire's video of this homemade store-bought apple pie but I'll admit I saw that it was 26 minutes long and I, I just kind of glanced through it. What about you guys? Did it, either one of you watch this oh, video? Wow. I started watching it, but I had not watched Don't Look Up at that point. And I was like, oh, this seems very spoilery already. Mm-hmm. So I stopped watching the Claire video. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I will go back and watch the rest of it. I Yeah, I saw the link too and then yeah i also have not seen the movie but i think it's so funny that i'm like yeah we used to watch half hour claire videos on the reg <laughs> <laughs> well uh speaking of back in back in the claire days we also wanted to discuss a video that popped up on youtube uh priya krishna and her mom made uh roasted alu gobi with drew barrymore on her talk show now this was a five minute video <laughs> The second time Priya's been on, on on Drew Drew Barrymore's talk show. The first time was with David Chang, right? To talk about their new cookbook. <laughs> I I thought it was I mean, I always love watching Priya and particularly with her mom. Um, I think they are cute. It's definitely different because it is like that talk show live audience style cooking. I don't know if it's because it's COVID, but like they weren't just making one dish. Like Priya and her mom were on one side and Drew was on the other. And they, Mm -hmm. and like Priya's mom was basically calling out like, okay, now put this in. And so it was sort of like dueling alu gobi recipes. I like Drew Barrymore's show. I don't know. She just like hits that nostalgia all the time when she's just like, remember all my movies? And I'm like, yeah, I do. (laughs) I, I enjoy Drew Barrymore just in general. I've always liked her. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting at the end where she was talking to Priya and her mom about how what she likes about their cookbook um, and just cooking in general is the idea of like passing these recipes down from generation to generation and connecting with like your grandmother, or your mother in that way, which just knowing like Drew Barrymore's background with her the Barrymore family and like her mother. It's also mm-hmm. just interesting to to see her talk about that sort of heritage. 
Yeah, I haven't seen much of the Drew Barrymore show, but she did seem to genuinely, authentically really enjoy Priya and Ritu's cookbook. She didn't seem to just be plugging it just for plugging's sake. And she does also seem to get a lot of women guests on her show. She does seem mm-hmm. very focused on promoting and elevating women. So I appreciated this segment. I thought it was fun and funny too. And they once again talk about Asa Fatida. I might be mispronouncing that, but the... No, you got it. Asa Fatida. Uh, all right. <laughs> that Indian spice that maybe not a lot of people know about. So I was reminded that I need to get some for my own pantry. <laughs> sometimes known as hing all right guys well that is all we have for the back burner we are going to give some shout outs first we would really like to give a giant thank you to all of our listeners who have helped us reach fifty thousand downloads which is just insane it's hard to believe it isn't just our families who listen to us so thank you all so much for your support (laughs) And we hope you'll continue listening and uh, giving us feedback and talking with us. Shout out to Maryland. (laughs) (laughs) Way to go, D.C. area. Thank you for listening. Um, We also want to say thank you to Edmonton Tourist, K.L. Blake, and Go Be Yourself podcast for sending some love for Justine's tortillere. You said it better than I do. (laughs) It's only because they took French. I was going to say, I think I Amanda studied French. <laughs> I did. I just am French Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I too had to take a language with my English degree. <laughs> also, most of those same people also shouted out your uh, your s'mores brownies, Justine. I think you have some fans. I've been making delicious things. Like... I mean, yes. If... If I could just pat like, myself on the back, pop over to your house. Oh my God, that reminds me. I had a dream that I was in your kitchen and I was helping you clean out your freezer and we were eating um, really delicious vegan food. <laughs> you want to come clean out my freezer? <laughs> Is that what you heard? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we'd also like to thank Ravenel on Instagram for continuing to share your naughtiest time to eat adventures with us. Everything is looking very delicious. And thank you to our buddy Heidi from Vibrant Visionaries for letting us know that she's still listening to this season, even though she is skipping the watch along. <laughs> she said it was too many bros broin. Bros be broin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Notice again the distinct lack of any women in these last two episodes we talked about. There were a few women in the food trucks, but did we get to talk to them? No. No. Well, thank you all again for getting in touch with us on social media, letting us know uh, what you're thinking about the episodes. Please continue to get in touch with us. And um, if you would like to, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else that you can leave a review for us. We would love to read them. Also, uh, emails. We love getting emails. It's fun. Podappetitepodcast at gmail.com. Podappetitepodcast at gmail.com. <laughs> well, thank you again for joining us. Next time on the podcast, we will be watching episode seven, Aaron Franklin, and episode eight, Hot Luck. The last two episodes of season one, volume one. Then what are we going to watch after that? Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know. Stay tuned. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. We'd love to hear from you, so find us on Twitter and Instagram at pod underscore appetite. And on Facebook at Pod Appetit Podcast. You can also email us at podappetitepodcast at gmail.com and find all of our episodes on our website, podappetitepodcast.com. We interrupt your regularly scheduled podcast programming. And we're not sorry. I'm Harmony. And I'm Maggie. And we're Rebel Girls Book Club. We're here to take an intersectional feminist approach to books from all over the spectrum. Best sellers? We've got you covered. That one book from English class you hated while you read but you can't forget? We've got that too. Comic books, nonfiction, it's all right here. So grab your tea, grab your blanket, and cue up your favorite podcast app of choice. Let's get rebellious about your new favorite reads.